Hello and welcome to At Home Sunday Worship with For and From St Catherine's. Uh, I'm joined today by Stephen who's going to do one of the readings for us. Uh, thank you for that Stephen. We're looking this month at stories of people who stepped out, stepped out into the unknown, stepped out into the daunting and the difficult uh, because it's nearly stepping out time, although it keeps getting delayed. So <laughs> maybe it'll be the end of the year before we can step out of our houses and get on with real life. I think it'll be sooner than that. Anyway, today we're going to look at what is, it's one of the best stories in the Bible. Uh, it's It's got to be, you ask people how many stories in the Bible they know, this one comes up. The story of David and Goliath. And we will travel with David as David stepped out to meet the highly equipped, highly trained soldier Goliath when David himself was just a kid. How did that feel for him? Well, that's a question that we will consider along the way. How do you think David was feeling as he stepped out to face the mighty giant? It's a great story, so I uh, hope that you enjoy it. I look forward to your company. To begin with, join me for our opening prayer. And so to the first part of our reading, which comes from the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 17, not as I put on the screen this morning in church, 71. There aren't 71 chapters. Anyway, here we go. Uh, David has arrived. He's seen Goliath challenging the Israelite army. He's seen all the Israelite soldiers, including his big brothers, looking terrified. And he's thought, oh, I need to do something about this. So he started talking about it. The message got to the king. When the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before King Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no one's heart fail because of him. Uh, your servant will go and fight this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You're not able to go and fight this Philistine. You're just a boy. He's been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep Sheep for his father, whenever a lion or a bear took a lamb from the flock, I went after it and struck it down, rescuing the lamb from its mouth. If it turned against me, I'd catch it by the jaw, strike it down and kill it. Your servant has killed both lions and bears. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, since he's defied the armies of the living God. David said, The Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will save me from the hand of this Philistine. So Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. Saul clothed David with his armour and put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail, and David strapped sword Saul over the armour, and he tried in vain to walk, for he was not used to them. Then David said to Saul, I can't walk with these, for I'm not used to them. So David removed them. He took his staff in his hand, he chose five smooth stones from the wadi and put them in his shepherd's bag in the pouch. With his sling in his hand, he drew near to the Philistine. We tend to think of this story as being the highly equipped, highly trained Goliath meeting the totally ill-equipped, totally untrained David. But that's not actually true. Certainly Goliath was highly equipped and highly trained. Uh, he's reported as being six cubits tall, which is about the height of the world's tallest men if you look at the Guinness Book of Records. So it's a credible height, although it'd be tough for him to be a fit soldier at that kind of height, but it's not impossible. The weight of his armour, as recorded, is actually less than the weight that your English, English uh, infantryman carries with him when he goes off to war. So that is, again, credible. Uh, the, the spear... That Goliath had, and I suspect his sword, had iron, an iron tip on the spear, a heavy iron tip, armour-piercing weaponry, and iron was the new military um, the new military equipment of the day. It was the new technology. It was the latest thing. It had just come out and it was a lot harder and sharper than bronze was. So we, we have this picture of Goliath in terms of his day as the guy who has all the latest modern weaponry. But David isn't going unarmed as well. David's got a slingshot 
And in the armies of the days, they had whole battalions of sling shooters. Uh, so it wasn't just a boy's toy. It was a serious bit of weaponry. It was a bit of military weaponry. And David knew how to use it, as we see later in the story. I guess all those many hours that he spent out looking after sheep, he had plenty of practice time. And here is the thing which is most remarkable about David. So David's made a strategic decision. He's using a long-range weapon. Goliath has short-range weapons. So David's not planning to get anywhere near the range of Goliath's weapon because he's got a slingshot. Goliath doesn't have one of those. But we learn something of David from what he takes with him. I asked you in the text if you could go back in time in a time machine to meet Goliath and were offered a gun, how many bullets would you take? And like me, somebody said, as many as you're allowed. I wouldn't trust my shot. David went down to the wadi, which is a dried up riverbed, and he got for himself five, five bullets, five smooth stones. I haven't got any smooth stones, so I've got eggs. I wouldn't recommend going against Goliath with eggs. I don't think it would turn out very well. Five. That's all. That's all. David is at the wadi. He's just got his shepherding kit. He's got his slingshot and he's thinking, how many do I need? OK, well, the first one I might miss with the first one. Might not get my range. Uh, the second one, OK, I might glance off his helmet. It might not actually take him out. But the third one, I'll get him with the third one. Surely, even if the first two fail, I'll get him with the third one. And well, I'll take a couple just in case, just in case something goes wrong. David is of the opinion that he can kill this man with just five. Five is as many as he can imagine needing. That is the level of confidence that he has in his weapon and in his ability to use his weapon. Actually, Goliath didn't stand a chance. He just didn't know it yet. And I think what we need to learn from this is not to be intimidated with what the rest of the world thinks we need. Uh, Saul thought that David needed the full kit, but he didn't. All the other Israelite soldiers, they thought they needed the full, the full kit and the height, and they didn't have it, and they were terrified. But David sees it differently. David sees what he can do with what he's got, and he can do it with what he's got, and he does. And I think that's the lesson for us. God isn't going to give us the full kit. We're not full kit kind of people. None of us are at St. Catherine's. But armed with what we do have, we can do a lot. We've just got to have the courage of our convictions, like David did, and get on with it. Good afternoon everyone. I hope everyone is well. Our second reading is taken from 1 Samuel 17 verses 41 to 51. Meanwhile, 
The Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said. I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcass of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by, the, by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is, is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down a Philistine and killed him. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from its sheath. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. This, this is a, it's such a lovely story. Who would not love the story of David and Goliath? And we love the idea that the underdog, the kid, wins against the, against the mighty warrior and the mighty enemy warrior as well. But it's, it's not a straightforward story. There's no miracles in the story. There's no acts of God here. David defeats Goliath fair and square using his own skills and his own equipment. Hole in one, one stone. One egg in my case, but just just the one. By the time he cut the man's head off with the man's own sword, he still had four stones to, I guess, discard or maybe kept them as souvenirs. I don't know. So what can we learn from this? I think motive is really, really important. If we're going to understand David, we have to understand his motives. And his motives weren't simple. Uh, very early on, when he first sees Goliath and thinks to himself, why are they all terrified? I could kill him. Uh, he, his first question is, what's the reward? What's the reward for killing this Philistine? So it's, it's not all pure and selfless stuff. The reward, incidentally, if you wanted to know, is that you and your family are exempt from tax for the rest of their lives and you get to marry the king's daughter. Not a bad deal. And David is certainly interested in that the tax exemption for his family and the king's daughter for himself, although he doesn't like the first of the daughters that King Saul offers him, but he goes for the second one. That doesn't turn out well either. Anyway, I, I distract myself. So David does definitely have some personal gain within this, but there is another thread that runs all the way through the story of David sees Goliath as an affront to God. This is not glorifying God. This Philistine who has spoken out against God, who has insulted God. Uh, David says to Saul, you know, I've killed lions and bears. I can kill this uncircumcised Philistine. There is, there is a sense of fighting for God's honour here. David sees that. David sees that he and his people are God's people. And this Philistine is insulting God by his behaviour. And therefore, that is one of the strong motives. So I don't think we have to be saints. If we're following the example of David, we don't have to go out into the world and be saints. 
We don't have to go out in the world and do things of which there is no benefit for us. We don't have to. But the guiding thing for David is that he is doing God's will. You come against me with a sword, a javelin and a spear, he says to Goliath. But I come against you in the name of the living God. Pow! It's the last words that Goliath ever heard, apart from a thud. And I think that we can learn, that we can do, that you and I can go out in this world looking that God's ways will be honoured, that God's people will be cared for. The people who God cares for most will be cared for. If we go out and about in the world with a determination to stand up for God's ways, for God's principles, for God's honour, then God will help us to put the resources that we already have available to us to excellent use, as he did in the case of David and his five stones. purpose of prayer, as I've said, I think probably lots of times, is to open our hearts and minds to the heart and mind of God so that we learn and come to see the world as God sees it. And David in this story is a fantastic example of that in reality, because all of the others are seeing Goliath and being terrified. They're seeing Goliath and being intimidated. They're seeing Goliath and thinking there's no hope for us. And yet, here's David, who sees Goliath and thinks, yeah, I can be him. And he does. When we pray for the world around us, when we bring to God the issues of the world around us, it's not about persuading God to do something that we don't think he's doing. But it's about asking God to open our eyes and our minds and our understandings to see these things as he sees them. And when we begin to see them as he sees them, then we will begin to see the opportunities that we can do something about. And when we pray, your will be done, your kingdom come, that's, that's what it's all about. Join me in Jesus' prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. <laughs>to the moment when I raise a toast to God and encourage you and invite you to raise a toast to God well I do so and today I'm going to raise my toast to God in 
apple and mango juice. And the very simple reason why I'm raising my toast to God in apple and mango juice is because that's what we've got in the fridge. Uh, but I think that's relevant because David used what he had. He had his slingshot with him. He'd taken it with him. He'd gone off to the battle to give his brother some cheese. Uh, but he'd taken his slingshot with him. And that was what he had. And that was what he used. And he could see that he could achieve this end. He could defeat this mighty enemy, this fearsome enemy, with what he had. And I think that what we need to do in this is trust what we have. God isn't going to give us things to do that we can't do with what he's already given us. So I've got apple and mango juice in the fridge and that's what I'm going to toast to God in. To our Heavenly Father, who invites us to be part of what he's doing in the world and has already given us all the kit that we need to do that, if only we would trust him and his way of doing things. To our Heavenly Father, our love and our praise. And may God bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he look kindly on you and give you peace. Today and every day, may God bless you. Amen.